Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Hannah Friedrich, and I'm a graduate student researcher at the Oregon State University. Um, and I am working on a larger project called Missing Millions, which is collaboration with HOT and DevSeed based in DC. Um, and I'm on a larger kind of team of Oregon State University people, including Anna Balashotis, David Rathel, and the PI on the project, my advisor, Jamin Vandenhoek. Um, and the Missing Millions project is really meant to use existing data on refugee settlements to characterize what settlements look like from space in order to use machine learning and crowdsourcing methods to predict um, as of yet to be mapped informal settlements. So these are cases like IDP settlements that are usually missing from OSM um, and kind of augment OSM to include, be more inclusive of informal settlements um, that are currently missing. So the previous talk was a really good segue of kind of talking about how OSM data can have direct impacts on public health. And this talk is a little bit more geared towards academic research impacts with OSM data. So um, I'll be talking about how specifically the refugee settlement boundary um, data in OSM uh, is really supporting the Missing Millions project and um, a slice of that project, which is most of my master's work. Um, so yeah. Let's dig in. Um, so currently there's over 70 million people forcibly displaced around the world. And the majority of that population is IDPs. There's about 20 million refugees that are under UNHCR or UNRWA mandate. Um, but 40 million IDPs um, are living around the world. And kind of across the board, people are displaced due to armed conflict, violence, persecution, gender-based violence, human rights violations. And understanding the pathways and mechanisms which people migrate are extremely complex. Um, but we do know that people who are seeking security and protection elsewhere um, are just looking to be safe and have access to basic services, which they're not able to access from their home country or home district. Um, and so since 2010, the forcibly displaced population has increased fourfold, which is a really kind of staggering statistic. Um, this is from one of the UNHCR site report, or sorry, UNHCR um, reports. So in 2010, the number of people that were newly displaced per day were 10, and in 2018, that number is close to 40. So um, responding to this kind of phenomena is extremely relevant right now. Um, if we look at a map of the refugee hosting countries, we see that Turkey and Pakistan and Uganda are the three top leading, <clears throat> excuse me, refugee hosting countries in the world. And the majority of refugees are kind of in sub-Saharan Africa or in um, Southeast Asia and the Middle East. So one of the responses to dealing with um, refugee resettlement and IDP resettlement is UNHCR, the UN Refugee Agency, shelters nearly a third of the global refugee population in UNHCR managed settlements. So these are formally managed, planned, organized settlements um, that are established within host countries. And across the board, there's, these settlements can look very different depending on what the landscape looks like before the settlement is established, kind of what the conditions are in the country of uh, the settlement being established. Um, and along with this variability, there's also many challenges um, with UNHCR site planning. So ensuring that there's sufficient space for both shelter and agriculture, if it's meant to be a longer term settlement program where these refugees are expected to be in a protracted refugee situation, which means they could be there for years to generations. Um, these settlements are meant to provide space um, for living and thriving. Um, there's also challenges with effectively distributing aid, so setting up settlements in a way that most effectively allows people to access aid and receive that. Um, also, limitations and challenges with providing access to services, and um, that includes education, healthcare, both within the settlement and outside of the settlement. Um, and also, with the establishment of a settlement which could be quite large, mitigating environmental damage um, or um, kind of climate related risk associated with the settlement being established somewhere. So this could be tree clearing near the settlement, um, 
or conversion of natural grasslands to grazing areas, being mindful of how these um, conversions in land cover can impact local environment and also local host community relationships. So as I've kind of alluded to, refugee settlements are extremely complex and dynamic. They tend to grow very quickly to accommodate newly incoming populations at a, over a very short amount of time. And it's common with this conversion to see variety of landscape changes or land cover changes, such as the settlement itself being built up, as well as forests being converted to agriculture, grazing lands being established, um, roads being established. Um, so they're very uh, complex. So if we look at um, satellite images of um, both the Zatari refugee camp in Jordan on the left and Kutapalong refugee settlement in Bangladesh, both of these are UNHCR managed settlements, they, but they look very different. Um, Zatari looks more formal. There's kind of this like road network that we can start to see, whereas Kutapalong is much more organic looking. Um, and they're both adhering to UNHCR settlement site conditions and planning, but due to the landscape can look very differently based on topo topography, soil conditions, um, mitigations that were taken to um, basically not have to deal with like flood plone areas and um, that nature. So while we have a lot of data on where settlements may be located, we lack an awareness of how settlements grow over time. So monitoring changes at refugee settlements is really critical for understanding local needs, opportunities and challenges related to sustainable site planning, but also providing the services that populations in these settlements need. Um, so understanding agriculture at settlements, how it becomes established, if it's productive, are people gaining from agricultural productivity, um, understanding deforestation or loss of vegetation at settlements. These have really key significant impacts on livelihoods within the settlements, as well as the livelihoods outside the settlements. So understanding how settlements grow and how they change and evolve over time can really bring light to these kind of challenges. So as a response to that call, um, Part of the Missing Millions project is looking at how we can use satellite time series analysis to measure the spatial and temporal distribution of land cover disturbances associated with the establishment and growth of refugee settlements, as well as to characterize the spectral changes associated with different land cover changes to attribute um, changes to different land cover changes. So the Missing Millions project has really gravitated to doing a lot of our training and understanding of these processes with Uganda because there is so much data available um, on Uganda, mostly in part due to the amazing work that Hot Uganda does um, and a lot of the attention internationally that Uganda has received in recent years with the refugee response efforts. Um, so this is just a map of the different refugee settlements in Uganda. Um, so to first kind of begin answering this question to document change within the settlement, you first have to uh, identify the settlement boundary. And the refugee settlement boundary is a layer in OSM and has been a really critical component in pushing forward, knowing where to get imagery for, and just to like begin with a delineation of what the settlement could be. So in addition to the boundaries themselves, there's also unique nodes such as clinics, latrines, primary schools, um, wash points, um, which are also really informative for understanding the context of the settlement, what services are available. Um, and I'll be talking more about how we can use those nodes in an SDG assessment framework um, at State of the Map on Sunday. So if you're interested in that, you should mark that on your calendar. Um, but back to the settlement boundary itself, um, while the settlement boundaries are really effective, they don't always capture all of the land cover conversions that happen with the establishment of a settlement. So in the case of this map here on the right, we see in orange the refugee settlement boundary that exists in OSM, but there's all of this agriculture and like peripheral settlement that is happening outside of the boundary itself. Um, so that is kind of what we're interested in capturing. So there's numerous um, satellite-based derived settlement data sets that exist, including GHSL, the Human 
or high resolution settlement layer and the world settlement footprint. Um, and oftentimes these rely on census data um, or are trained on satellite imagery of like huge megalops or like huge metropolis areas and are not very well suited to predict uh, informal settlements or refugee settlements. Um, and because refugee settlement or refugee populations are often omitted from national census data, this in combination with the um, kind of narrow training data excludes refugee settlements and informal settlements from these larger global settlement uh, data sets. Um, so to kind of overcome this limitation, we've used a very simple clustering approach with k-means to um, identify kind of a more formal uh, boundary of the settlement itself. So in the case of neo Monzi re refugee settlement, we have the OSM boundary here, which is also the official UNHCR settlement boundary. Um, in pink is the k-mean, so what we've kind of estimated of the settlement, which seems to adhere well to what we see in the satellite image. Um, but we see with the world settlement footprint and HRSL that they're just capturing these small pockets of settlement. Um, so it's not a comprehensive view of what settlement is according to these global data sets. Um, and similar here, um, we see that the pink is capturing much more of the actual built up area, what we would see and characterize a settlement, whereas these global data sets are um, failing to do so. So this kind of speaks to the urgency of coming up with um, innovative methods to include these populations and actually put them on the map and how remote sensing and OSM can be coupled to do that. So I'll be focusing mostly on Pajarina refugee settlement um, for the rest of my talk, but um, this kind of here shows a side by side of the Pajarina refugee settlement as it exists in OSM and then how the k-means settlement clustering method, um, which is a really quite simple approach to just taking an image and breaking it out into two different clusters um, captures the spillover effect of settlement outside of the boundary um, a little bit more effectively. So to begin to understand how to characterize lang or, um, settlement growth over time, we kind of approached it as a disturbance event, which is kind of a little bit remote sensing lingo-ish, but a disturbance event is can be an abrupt state and change, so from forest cleared to agriculture, or a gradual change in condition, so a forest thinning over time um, due to drought or browning. Um, and we, to assess settlement establishment, we used BFAST, or Breaks for Additive Seasonal and Trend, which is a disturbance detection algorithm which accounts for both long-term um, changes like browning or drought, um, as well as seasonal trends of phenology. So we're not overestimating settlement establishment just because we're in the dry season of the year. So it can be really effective in working in like a semi-arid environment like Uganda. So this is kind of an example of what um, BFAST outputs look like for a single point. Um, we have two images, one from June and September. Um, Pajarina was opened in June, um, and you can see it really expanded really quickly. Um, the yellow point is of a considered like a non-settlement area, so a point that would not undergo disturbance to settlement. Um, and the red is where we see settlement being established. So uh, on the top here, um, for the red point, we have this timeline or time series of NDVI, which for those of you who are unfamiliar is just a measure of vegetative productivity. So we see this very expected signal in NDVI throughout the years, and then 2016 hits, and then that signal drops. So i.e. there is a conversion from grassland to um, building or settlement, and BFAST will uh, assign this red dotted line, which is the break point. So that is when BFAST says, okay, something changed, there was a disturbance, this is when the settlement was established. Um, and for the non-settlement area, we see that there's no breakpoint assigned. So that's promising. And so we can use this kind of data to begin to parameterize a model which can therefore be applied to an, an entire scene or settlement area. So here we have 
this early settlement, late settlement, and later on we'll see agricultural um, establishment start to happen in the southeastern corner of the image. But um, using training data like this can help us understand how to use BFAST in a way that's kind of most geared towards looking at settlement establishment as opposed to just finding agricultural areas or just finding grazing areas. Um, so this is a Sentinel-2 time series, um, which just shows all the available Sentinel-2 imagery from 2016 up into 2017 at Pajrina. So kind of skipping forward to some of the results that we have, um, we were also interested in looking at the spectral changes over time with um, settlement being established. And this um, legend is showing the drop in NDVI. Um, so in areas where we see a large magnitude of change or drop, um, those are the really dense parts of the settlement. So that's where the reception center is. That's where there's really densely clustered buildings together. And we see a smaller magnitude of change in areas where there's just agricultural being, or agriculture being converted, um, or um, really not very densely clustered buildings together. Um, and so we can also use BFAST to understand and attribute a change month. So what month a certain pixel undergoes conversion from um, natural grassland to settlement. Um, so here, this is for 2016 and 2017, um, which is kind of interesting to see that the individual roads are actually being picked up um, in their conversion to settlement. Um, and I should mention all of this was mostly done with Landsat, so 30 meter resolution. Um, and we can see that the settlement is initially established in the southwest corner and then expands north to the northeast. Um, and then in 2017, a lot of the change pixels or disturbed pixels we're seeing are in the agricultural areas, which makes sense because a lot of agriculture is established at the beginning of the year. Um, and so the, ch the fact that we're seeing disturbance pixels in January through April is promising that that's actually picking up on agriculture. Um, so kind of distilling those maps into a frequency and time graph, um, we can kind of pick through this step-by-step -step account of establishment and expansion of Pajarina over time. Um, so this is really effective for understanding month by month how much settlement is changing, um, what's expanding where, and how different land covers can be attributed to this kind of disturbance um, detection method. Um, so I also mentioned at the beginning of the talk um, that alongside getting refugee settlement boundary data from OSM, we've also gathered OSM nodes. So this entails um, those clinics, health points, wash points, motorized boreholes, um, primary schools, pre-primary schools. Um, and our initial assessment was kind of looking at when these nodes get added to OSM to see if the timestamp of when they're added, how much that lags behind when we see that in satellite imagery. Um, and in the case of Pajarina, most of these nodes were added in 2018, so two years after we actually see this change on the landscape. Um, so it kind of begs the question for how we can use real-time editing and um, contributions to OSM to complement our understandings of settlement expansion with satellite imagery over time. So just to wrap up here, we have um, Kind of a really interesting example of how OSM and satellite time series analysis dovetail really well to complete a more complete view of settlement expansion over time. So OSM data, both validated from on the ground and contributed to by the crowd, um, offers a really unique view of context. And satellite image time series offers a systematic narrative of settlement expansion over time. So together, um, they can be used to kind of provide a more comprehensive view of settlement expansion. Um, so that kind of leads me to the end. I know we're also about time. So thank you, and I'll take any questions if anybody has anything. <laughs>